If you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn to Luke uh, chapter 14. We'll be looking at verses 15 through 24. <laughs> I hope uh, you and your family had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. And um, you had a lot of turkey to eat. And you still are eating the leftovers and enjoying them as well. I've been waiting for my turkey chili pie. And I think I'll have that for lunch today. So looking forward to that. During the holiday season, there's a, a lot of invitations that go out. Maybe you got a th- uh, invited to a Thanksgiving meal or you invited someone to Thanksgiving uh, this holiday. And of course, we have uh, Christmas coming up. And so there's going to be a lot of different parties and dinners and all kinds of events going on. I was looking, sitting down with Karen, looking over our calendars uh, for the month of December, and uh, we've already got several um, parties and meals that are scheduled, and I'll probably have a few more that's added to that. And uh, you receive invitations to come to those, and it's, it's just a common thing. Well, uh, Jesus was at a, uh, a party one day, and he had been invited to a uh, prominent Pharisee's house and uh, he during that time here we find in Luke chapter 14 that uh, Jesus told a parable about God's invitation because God's going to give a banquet and he's inviting all of us to be a part of that family meal and the invitation has gone out and as Jesus was eating dinner with that religious leader and the others that were there pretty prominent Uh, people in the town, um, he noticed that a lot of them, when they came in, were competing for the best spot at the table, and they were trying to get the place of honor, and uh, so Jesus uh, told them, look, um, you don't want to do that, because what if you sit down, and the the host comes to you and says, why don't you move on down here, got somebody more important to come and sit in your place, he said, you'll be embarrassed. But then he went on and he said, no, as a matter of fact, when you give an invitation, uh, what you probably should do is invite those people who are disadvantaged, those who are poor, those who are lame, those who are blind, those that can't repay you in any way, invite them to your dinner table and give them a place of prominence. And then you'll be blessed by uh, the Father in heaven. And that's the best way to show your generosity and to give an invitation to someone. Well, that brought up the subject of God's great banquet feast because the Jewish uh, people taught that, that when God's kingdom came to be, that all of us would sit around in paradise in God's kingdom and we'd have this big celebratory meal uh, with God in heaven. And so it says in, in verses 14 or 15 and 16, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. So the man says, oh, that reminds me, we're all going to eat in the kingdom of God, have this big meal. And so Jesus tells a parable and it has to do with the kingdom of God. It has to do with God's banquet meal that he's inviting each and every one of us to. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning, this invitation to the banquet. Because you see, everyone is invited to God's banquet table. Everyone's invited to God's banquet table. He wants each one of us to be there to eat at the feast. And so you have an open invitation right now to be part of God's great banquet that he's going to have one day in his presence in the kingdom of God. And and so as we look at this passage this morning, let's go down through the parable Jesus told and uh, and see what he's beginning to tell us about this great kingdom feast that God is going to give to each and every one of us. And uh, the first thing we want to look at is is that uh, we don't want to miss dinner. You don't want to miss dinner. Uh, You want to be there, don't you? Uh, When God invites you to be part of his banquet, you want to be there. You don't want to miss the meal. And uh, it's important that you show up because the Father is expecting you to be there. Now, when I was a kid, 
we lived in the suburbs and uh, there were one house after another go block after block after block there in, in New York, in Tonawanda, New York. And uh, so the kids would ride their bikes up and down the street and, and sometimes it'd be around supper time, it's starting to get a little bit dark and, and I'd be down at the far end of the street on the block playing with some friends of mine and my dad would come out and I would hear him whistle and he would whistle and I knew who it was that was calling me and then he'd go, Gregory! Dinner's ready, get here now. And uh, I don't want to miss dinner when he does that because that means hurry up. There's some urgency to it. You need to get on the road and get down there to the house so you can eat supper with the rest of the family. And maybe you had an experience like that too where you're called to dinner and I don't want to say it again, get here to the meal, turn off the TV, put up what you're doing, Get here to eat. It's time to eat supper. And so we don't want to miss dinner. The invitation's been given. You, you see, the feast is ready to eat. The feast is all ready to eat. It's been laid out. And notice what it says there in verses 16 and 17. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything's now ready. So here's, here's what happens. And we do that today. You get this little invitation in the mail, and it says you're invited uh, to come to this meal at such and such place, RSVP. And so you write back and say, RSVP, we're, yeah, we're going to be there at that meal. So you get the invitation ahead of time. Well, that date comes, and the meal's ready, and uh, they say, come on and get it. And so at that time when Jesus was telling the story, uh, the invitation would have already been extended. So it was an invitation to those that he was calling to come to the dinner. So the servant would go to these individuals that had been invited and say, it's on the table, it's ready. It's time to get here to eat the meal right now. There was a certain urgency about it. And so uh, there was a, a calling by the servant for them to come immediately and don't miss the dinner. You see, all of us are invited. Everything's ready. And, and all we have to do is sit down and eat. That's, that's the open invitation that's been given to us. But, but here's what happens. Even though they knew the meal was coming, they had been invited ahead of time, there were some that gave excuses for not showing up to the dinner, for not coming to the meal. But as we find out in this parable, excuses are not acceptable. They're not acceptable at all. Notice what it says there in verses 18 through 20. But they all alike began to make excuses. So these that were invited began to make excuses about why they couldn't come to the meal, why they couldn't come to the banquet. And uh, as a result of that, um, the, the table was getting empty. And the table wasn't full. And the owner who had invited everybody to this meal was getting worried because people had made some excuses. You, you know, um, I have a concern because I, I'm noticing that the table's not full at church anymore. That uh, we're ha having a little decline in Sunday school. John Paul at the teacher's meeting showed us uh, the charts over the last two years about Sunday school, how it's steadily declined. And there might be some reasons that we could give for that, aging and people uh, going into uh, nursing homes and uh, some passing on and uh, other reasons that might be given, but, but we've noticed a steady decline. And what that means is that, that there's some excuses being made about why they can't participate and be a part of the Sunday school. And, and you might be one of those people that just doesn't come to Sunday school anymore. You say, well, why is that so important? Because that's family time. That's small group time. That's when you get to build relationships and bond with one another and develop a, a, a feeling of mutual sharing in the love of God as you walk this journey together with God's people. 
And that takes place in a small group. So Sunday school is important. Um, I've noticed grow. Our outreach ministry has declined. It used to be we had 40 to 50 people involved in grow outreach. And uh, now we're lucky if we have 10. It's just not a priority. And yet we look around and we see the results. And the results are no one's showing up at the table. The pews are empty. And, and we're just making excuses about why that is. You, you say, well, what kind of excuses are people making? Well, the same ones they made here. Look at verse 18. Business activities sometimes are excuses. The first said, I just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Now, that's kind of lame, isn't it? He'd already been invited to the feast. He knew uh, where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be at the table, and yet he chose to let his business activities and the busyness of life take priority over the invitation to show up at the meal. He's so busy in life that he had no time for God. We still do that today. Notice another thing, the, another one in verse 19 there. Possessions, hobbies, sports, they, they can become excuses. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. I mean, he got the latest and the best oxen. By golly, he was going to try them out. You know, it, it was time to try those oxen out. I got a new car. I'm going to go try it out. I got a new video game. I'm going to go try it out. I, I, I've got this new uh, opportunity to buy something. I'm going to try it out. And, and so we have the same thing happening now where possessions and hobbies and sports replace God and his activities. I remember talking with a pastor one time and, and he was quite concerned because that was the time when um, everybody got those, those vans and they would uh, trick them out. They'd get them all sported up and ready for camping. And so he said, half my congregation is gone on Sunday because they all got these new vans uh, for camping and they go off on the weekends and they don't show up on Sundays because hobbies and sports have taken over. I remember one family, I, was, I met a guy in the Walmart, family had been attending church and they were following their daughter and her sports activities and they were all involved in the sports. It was like one of those traveling teams that you have, you know. And uh, he, he said this, you know, right now, he said, um, we're not coming to church because we're following my daughter's sports team. And as, as soon as uh, she gets through with that sports uh, team, we'll, we'll be back at church. But you know, I never saw him again. Never saw them again. They continued to go on the road trips. They went into the high school sports. And then the daughter graduated and the family had lost all interest in church. Never involved again. You don't mean to make excuses like that. But yet that took priority over the invitation to be a part of what God's doing in this world. And, and then good things, including family and friends. They, they sometimes become excuses. Sometimes good things replace the best things in life. And there's nothing wrong with being with your family and being with your friends. But do they really take priority over being with God and his family? You see, there's, a, there's time for your family and your friends. And there's time to be in the house of the Lord and, and uh, just have your spirit strengthened and encouraged and nourished. And be with God's people and pray together and sing together and fellowship together. You see, this young man said, I just got married, so I can't come. Well, there was an old law in, in Deuteronomy that said uh, if a young man was married, he and his bride had one year. They couldn't be called up for military service. They couldn't be called up for other activities and, and uh, requirements. Uh, they had one year just of marital bliss. And so I'm sure this young man is using that as his excuse I've got scriptural grounds on why I can't come to church, why I can't be a part of what God's doing, why I can't go to the invitation to the banquet. 
Well, that's kind of lame, you know. Um, maybe it would have been nice to take his bride to a banquet and have a good time at a party. And, and so all excuses become just that, excuses. And, and as a result of that, you miss out on what God is doing. You miss out on the banquet. You miss out on the party that's going to take place. You, you see, the family expects you to be there. The family expects you to be there. When the invitation is given and you're invited to the party and everyone's sitting around the table, everyone's waiting for you to show up too. Everyone's waiting for you to come and dine as well and be a part of what's going on. Be a part of the celebration that God is giving. Notice, notice what happens here. The servant came back and reported this to his master, all those excuses that were being made, and then the owner of the house became angry. He got upset because they refused his invitation without any good reason at all. They became angry. You see, it's important to be at the table. It's important to be a part of where the family is and participate in the meal together. Now, Karen and I, uh, when I went on sabbatical several years ago, we went to Switzerland as part of that, and uh, we went to a place called Labrie. And when we went to Labrie, we uh, were going to spend time at, at a study retreat and uh, spend about a week there and, and just take time to relax and fellowship and so on. Is a video? There it is. Okay. Can't read that very well. It says Labrie. That's a sign out front, and that's Karen sitting there. So we're trying to figure out where to go once the bus dropped us off. But we got there, and we were going to spend time there in that study retreat. And so you would spend time um, working, spend time studying, spend time uh, in fellowship and getting to know people that were there. This is where we stayed. It was a chalet. It was very nice. And it was real big, it used to be uh, uh, lodging for children at a children's home, and it held a lot of different people, but uh, it had been turned into this retreat center, and uh, Karen and I slept there. Well, right next to it was this little chalet. This was the original home at Labrie, where the Shapers were, and um, every day uh, you were assigned a certain task to do. Well, one day I was assigned uh, with another fella to clean up the yard around this place, especially in the back. All the weeds had grown up, and uh, so it was hot, even though we're up in the mountains, and, and so we were cutting down the weeds and, and pulling uh, uh, weeds out of the ground, and, and uh, a lot of different trees were cut down, and so there's a lot of yard debris, yard trash as a result of that. Well, every day you were supposed to go to different places to eat. They had like uh, four or five different homes that people open their homes for you to come and eat uh, with the rest of the group. And the rule was that uh, they didn't start the meal unless everyone was there. Everyone had to be at the table to show up. Well, here I was up there uh, working in the yard, and they said it's about time to get ready to go to lunch. Well, I thought I had read on the chart in the morning that I was supposed to go eat lunch at the chalet right next door to where I was working in the yard. And um, I thought wrong. I discovered I made a mistake. But I didn't know it at the time, so we took the uh, wheelbarrows and put all the yard debris in them, and we r rolled them down this road, and it went all the way to the city dump at the other end of the village. And, and we dumped everything. And by this time, I'm realizing I'm late. I'm getting late. I better hurry up. So we're running back, pushing the wheelbarrow, and um, I get to the chalet. I walk in, and nobody's there to eat. And suddenly I realize I'm in the wrong place. I, I should have been there. And so I quickly changed my clothes because it's all sweaty. I reread it, tried to figure out where I was supposed to go. Then I discover that I'm supposed to walk down all the way at the other side of town, down the hill to the bottom of the hill. You see the long path down there. And uh, that's where I'm supposed to eat. And I'm already late. So here I am in a panic, and I'm running down the hill. 
and, and I run into one of the sons of one of the uh, families that lived there, and I said, his name happened to be Greg. I said, Greg, where do I go? He goes, you're going to be in my house, so let's go. So we went on down there, and I tried to keep up with him. He had been in, living in the mountains for a long time, and I was just from Florida, we're in fat, flat land, and uh, as a result of that, it was a fat man, too. So it was kind of hard to, to get down the bottom of that hill. But I got there, I was soaking wet, running out of breath, and I walked in, and there's everybody sitting at the table. And no one was eating, because you didn't eat until everybody showed up. And so I walked in and made as many apologies as possible, and, and they had their prayer, and while uh, they all began to pass the food and eat, I began to drink about five gallons of water to try to get my breath and get my uh, water back. So it's important to show up because the family expects you to be there. And if you're not there, if you're not involved, if you're not eating at the table, you're going to miss out. But others are going to miss out as well. And so Jesus is saying, look, the invitation has been given. God expects you to be a part of that. The family depends on you to be there, and you need to show up. Well, then the master of the house decides, well, they're not showing up. They made excuses, so what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to invite all your neighbors. Invite all your neighbors. Let them come, too. Let them come and be a part of this meal. If the people that were invited aren't showing up, Let's make sure the neighbors are welcome and bring them in. You see, we want to have a full table. That's the goal of the master. That's the goal of the man in this parable, and that's the goal of the Father in heaven. He wants everybody to participate in the banquet. Uh, Janet Yancey, who is the wife of Philip Yancey, who uh, we've used some of his materials in discipleship classes, um, she tells a story about when she was working uh, at a church in Chicago, and every Sunday morning they would get up and they would uh, feed breakfast to about 50 or 60 senior citizens. And then some street people and homeless people would walk in off the street and they would eat as well. And um, so they, they got up early, they fixed the meal, and, and the People came in, a lot of them were cranky, and they uh, didn't want to be there. Others were complaining about how it was raining outside. and So it was just kind of a grumpy, grouchy day while the uh, church people prepared the meal and passed it out to those that had come to eat. Well, uh, one of the men came up to Janet Yancey and said, there's a fellow out here that wants to speak to you. And so she walked out and, and met this man, <coughs> And she said he looked uh, pretty clean cut. He didn't, didn't seem to be a normal street person, but she was expecting to hear a story again. And sure enough, he started. He said, I, I just want to find out if we could uh, get, get a breakfast and a meal for my family. I said, my car broke down, and I've used all the money I had to buy a starter and put it on myself, but now we don't have any money for food, and we're heading back to Milwaukee, and... Uh, my wife's just been put in a mental institution. And I've got four kids in the car with me, and we just just want something to eat. Could you help us out? And she said he's, his story seemed legitimate, so she invited the family in. And they came in, and uh, suddenly they were embraced. The senior citizens hadn't seen children in a long time. And so instead of being grumpy and grouchy, they suddenly became bright and lively again, and they began to pull the kids over and said, hey, come on, let me, let me get you a biscuit. Let me get you some eggs. Let me get you something to eat. And so suddenly that family was embraced by all the people who had shown up at the breakfast. And what turned from a time of being gloomy and moody and grouchy suddenly became a time of blessing and happiness and joy. And, and the senior citizens brightened up and, and the homeless that were there began to even share what they had with uh, this family. It was a transformation that took place because they welcomed their neighbor, those who were disadvantaged, to come and eat with them. And the family went on their way after that. You, you see, we need to invite all our neighbors 
those that we feel comfortable with and those that we don't feel comfortable with. You see, there, there's still room for more at the table. There's still room for more at the table. And so we need to open it up to everybody that we can. Invite your neighbors that, that can't repay you. Make, make sure that, that you uh, invite them because that is true generosity. It's rather than expecting something in return, you're opening your arms to those that can't repay you. And so you need to share your table with the disadvantaged and the underprivileged and help them out. Make sure that they are blessed with the way God has blessed you. So the banquet's open to everyone, and, and especially our disadvantaged neighbors, our underprivileged neighbors. And we as a church do that. We, we have a community meal every Wednesday, and we go out to Grace Marketplace one Sunday out of the month. And so we open our doors to the community, and anyone can come, and especially those who are underprivileged and disadvantaged. And some people have said that um, this is the only hot meal they get all week when they come to our church to get a meal on Wednesday night. And so that's the spirit of what Jesus is telling in this parable. <coughs> Notice what it says in verse 21. The owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant. Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And, and so you go out and invite those that don't expect to be invited. You invite those who can't repay you. You invite those who, who really need help. And you're going to open your doors. You're going to open uh, your table up to those to share with you the meal that they were not expecting. And we can do that in a variety of ways, through our community meal, through our outreach ministries that way. We can do it through our grow outreach on, on uh, Tuesday nights or at other times during the week. You don't have to be a part of grow per se, but if you're doing the work of ministry and doing outreach, that's the same thing as what we do on grow night uh, each and every week. Uh, you have an opportunity in your bulletin. You have uh, information about the dinner theater that's coming up. This is a way to invite your neighbors and to bring them in, to let them share in God's feast. Oh, we, we have this wonderful production that's being produced, but it's not a production in the sense of Hollywood or Broadway. It's a production in the sense of trying to reach out and share the good news of God's word of Jesus Christ with those in our neighborhood. And you have an opportunity to invite them. So buy a few tickets. And bring your neighbors in. Let them come uh, with you to this dinner theater. They get a good meal and they get to hear the good news of Jesus Christ as well. Um, there's a little thing in your, in your uh, bulletin. It's a little card. Do you see that? It says, Jesus among secular gods. Well, Ravi Zacharias is a, an evangelist and a uh, Christian speaker who has spoken with uh, people at universities and colleges around the world. And he especially works with those that consider themselves atheists and agnostics and have questions that uh, don't seem to be answered uh, by the church. And so Rabbi Zacharias has been gifted by God to reach out to those individuals. Well, he does forums, and we're going to have a forum here at the Stephen O'Connor Center in January. And um, this was, like, unprecedented. Rabbi Zacharias had one date that was scheduled, and uh, it was possibility for him to go there, and then that group canceled. Well, the Stephen O'Connor Center had one date open in January that they could have someone to come, and it happened to be the same date that this other group canceled. And so Ravi Zacharias said, yeah, we'll come. And O'Connell Center said, yes, you can have this meeting together. And all of us said, that sounds like God at work, doesn't it? That God would just arrange it that Ravi Zacharias could come to UF and speak to the university community. And so a lot of churches have already gathered together, and uh, they're uh, going to open uh, their doors to uh, witnessing and sharing and 
bringing others in to go hear Ravi Zacharias when he comes. But it's not just one night. There's a whole week of schedule where they're going to have conversations with students all week long on the University of Florida and uh, Santa Fe College campuses. And churches are invited to join in that outreach ministry. But the, this uh, particular event's not just for students, it's also for the community. And so this is an opportunity for you to individually bring someone to this event and hear the gospel presented in a unique way. And I hope that you'll begin to pray about that event because our church will be participating in it. And so we need to go out into the alleys of the town, the streets of the town, any way we can to bring people to come in to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be a part of what God is doing in this world and to share in that great feast that he has offered to each and every one of us. But don't just stop there. Don't just stop locally. We have to extend it beyond that. Extend the invitation to everyone everywhere. Let it go far beyond just Gainesville or Alachua County. Let it go far beyond just Florida. Let it go around the world and begin to share the good news of Jesus Christ with everyone everywhere. And allow them to participate in the banquet. Allow them to be a part of the meal that God has provided for each and every one of us. You see, there's still room at the table. There's still room at the table. And so we need to move out of our comfort zone and reach out to those who are different and distant. Those that are beyond who we are and, and begin to share the good news with them and, and give the invitation to them and allow them to come and be a part of this great banquet that God has uh, prepared for each and every one of us. Notice what it says in verses 22 and 23. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in, so my house will be full. No notice it says there's still room. There's still room at the table. And so we not only need to invite those in our Jerusalem, those who are right around us, we need to invite those that are far beyond us and go as far as we can, any way we can, to invite them to be a part of this great meal that God has prepared, this great banquet, this great feast in the kingdom of God. And so the master of the house said, go out into the highways and the byways, the country roads and the country lanes. <coughs> go out there. And, and compel people to come in, bring them in, do whatever you can to, to bring them into this great feast of the kingdom. And, and we do that, don't we? We do that when we give our monies and our prayers and our offerings and our mission trips to uh, those who are missionaries and sent to these faraway places. And sometimes we go on mission teams to do that kind of ministry as well. I never really fully understood the impact of these words until one day when I was a teenager, we had a, a uh, revival service at the church I was a part of in western New York. And uh, the church was small, and uh, the revival services weren't going very well. But we had this group that had come up from Texas. It was a youth group, and they were uh, a choir that were singing. And they had a, an evangelist Ned, named Ed Human with them. And Ed Human was just a dynamic evangelist. And he would uh, constantly be sharing the gospel with everybody he met. And so um, first night, not very many people showed up. It was a small little mission church we were a part of. And so Ed Human says, we need to get people to come to this revival. And so he got his choir that came with him. And he got some of us who were part of the church. And he said, here's what I want you to do. Jesus said, go out into the highways and the byways and bring them in. So that's what we're going to do. And we just spread out all over the town. Everybody we saw, we said, hey, come on, we're having this event tonight. You be a part of that. And you know what happened? The place was filled that night with people. Because we literally took these words that Jesus said. Go out into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in. People are willing to come if you're excited about what you're inviting them to. And, and you want them to be a part 
of what you're involved in. And so we need to go and compel them and constrain them and encourage them to be a part of what God has invited them to and go out into those highways and byways and, and bring them in so his house will be full. So the table will be full. And here's the warning. If you miss the banquet, you miss everything. The master said, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Those that made excuses, those that <coughs> said we're not going to participate, they missed it. They missed the banquet. They missed the feast. They missed the blessings that come with doing what God wants. So we don't want to miss dinner. We don't want to miss the opportunity to share dinner with others. You see, we have an opportunity, not only locally to share the good news, but internationally. In your bulletin, you'll see uh, a little form that has a list of different missionaries around the world. And you can pray every day for one of these missionary families who are ministering around the globe. And, and you know, the good news about all this is that that uh, when you pray, when you give, God blesses. Do you know that when you give to the Christmas offering and you use your envelope to contribute, that 100% of that goes to support IMB missionaries and their work around the world? There's 3,500 missionaries, almost 3,600. Last year, 1.9 million heard the gospel. There were 175,000 new believers, 15,000 trained pastors, and over 6,000 new churches, all because of your prayers and your giving and the work of the missionaries around this globe. Go to places that are distant. Go to places that are different. And you can do that through giving to the Christmas offering and being a part of praying for our missionaries around the world. So let's close with a video that shows us what our missionaries are doing around the globe. It shows how you can extend beyond our borders and invite people from everywhere to be a part of what God's doing in this world. Maybe. <laughs> What's that? So low you can't hear, yes. <laughs> That's all right. We'll, we'll pass on that video. If you'd like to see more, come Wednesday, and uh, we'll see the video as our uh, music team comes up to sing and lead us in song this morning. You can have a part of what God's doing around the world through our missions giving and mission outreach and giving through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Let's all stand together and pray. Father, as we think about the invitation, you've invited us to the table. And Lord, we don't want to miss dinner. We don't want to miss the opportunity to share in the great banquet you prepared for us. But we want to share that with others too. So give us grace to invite our neighbors and to invite those who are far off in distant lands and distant places and different from us. Lord, don't let us neglect to tell others about Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Amen.